Welcome to Mental Health Awareness. I'm Dr. Ann Coretti, Director of Student Services for Nauset Public Schools. And today my guest is Margot Easterbrook Steinstra. And she's a psychotherapist with Child and Family Services. And Child and Family Services is located in Harwich and in Hyannis. Hyannis, and headquartered in New Bedford. And headquartered in New Bedford, okay. So today we're gonna to talk about depression. And Margo has done a lot of work in this area, and we're just gonna start off talking about um, what depression is, how it differs from sadness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great place to start, and I think um, uh, depression is sort of battered about as a, as a just a common phrase, and, and we often mean different things by depression. Um, but I think uh, an important distinction is that when people are, ex and, and sadness, you mentioned sadness, is one very, very important symptom of what we call clinical depression. So um, when people are just having a, a sad uh, state of mind or mood for a prolonged period, uh, obviously uh, one starts to be very concerned. Sadness is just our natural body's response to managing our environment and the stresses of day-to-day -day life uh, but, uh, and, and different calamities that can occur. But depression, we talk about depression when this becomes an entrenched mode of, of feeling and, uh, and behavior. So uh, we're especially looking at when our, we're just not able to function as well. So you can't get up in the morning. Hard to get up in the morning, hard to maybe regulate sleep, appetite, uh, how to um, just be able to uh, meet different situations uh, at school or work. Um, Feeling like really weighed down. Weighed down, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so functioning begins to uh, decrease, and also relationships. Sometimes a person doesn't even notice their own depression, but others in, in the family or friends just say, gosh, you just seem so negative all the time, or you seem so down all the time, or you're so quiet. It's, you're not yourself lately, this kind of thing. So sometimes it's externally noticed and observed. The person themselves hasn't really caught, caught up with it. Mm. So that's uh, one of the important distinctions. Um, you know, our, we're always trying to uh, regulate all the stresses of life, which is a mm -hmm. tough task. Mm -hmm. So there, there are things in the environment that could trigger the sadness, mm -hmm. environmental situations, which in some, some degree is normal. It's sure. part of the human experience, right. right? But there are times when you just get stuck yeah, I think, you know, we can, when we speak of environment, we could mean uh, the weather, the climate, right? Many, mm -hmm. there tends to be more depression uh, in the winter when there's less light and less opportunity to get out and move and do the kinds of things people may want to do. Um, just overcast weather for a long time. Some people are particularly sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but environment could also mean just the environment, the routine of your work or school or family life, and you just get stuck in um, a little bit of hopelessness about whether you can bring in change where you need to mm -hmm. or getting susceptible to other people's expectations and losing a bit of your what, what drives you personally. Mm -hmm. Some of those things can kind of lead to depression. So there are treatments. Absolutely, this is the good news. And unfortunately, um, there is sometimes a general reluctance to go seek help on this very, very common and important um, kind of distress that we call depression. There's definitely help out there. First of all, there are things you can do for yourself. And then there's enlisting help. And I think both of those things, uh, I would hope listeners would, would keep in mind. What kinds of things can you do for yourself? Just, if you could just name a couple of things. Well, one important one, I think, is we tend to forget that the body is our first way of mediating the world. And we, we, we talk about the body, and we're very sports-oriented as a culture, but we don't always take seriously when we're feeling pain or distress or discomfort in the body. And sometimes depression shows up there. So taking care of the body, basic things like drinking enough water, that's a good demonstration. Sounds crazy, but <laughs> really that's so important throughout the day. Um, eating healthy foods that don't mm -hmm. have too many additives. 
um, exercise as a, as a major one. And it doesn't have to be anything terribly extreme, but just trying to get some exercise regularly through the day or through the week is, is important. Um, so diet, exercise. Diet. And then I would go so far as to say, um, if you are inclined toward artwork, any kind of, um, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a great artist, but just to find ways that you like to play on paper with paints, crayons, anything to bring a little color in your lives. Some people like gardening, working with plants, mm -hmm. which can be very nice in the winter when you make maybe indoor terrariums instead of outdoor mm -hmm. gardens. Uh, but working with earth and plants is uh, very, very helpful. Um, some people like drama. Um, a lot of people have said to me over the years, expression is the opposite of depression. Right? Oh. Um, and to be able to find ways to put your feelings out somewhere in an appropriate way. Um, creatively can mm -hmm. be very, very helpful for people. And regular, Crafts. regular sleep? Sleep is one of the most important aspects. I'm really glad you mentioned it because some people don't take it seriously enough. Um, erratic sleep, sleeping too much or getting too little sleep or sleeping erratically mm -hmm. is in fact one of the main symptoms of depression. But to the extent that a person can try to regulate their own sleep um, and, you know, get off the computer in an hour or so before bedtime, at, at least an hour before, uh, or not sort of tent, you know, be tempted into reading late into the night or hmm. uh, getting up into the, in the night, if you can possibly just tell yourself to just uh, concentrate on your breathing mm -hmm. or... Uh, feel basic comfort, you know, mm -hmm. of the comfort of your bed or your sheets or your blanket or whatever, something really tactile and basic that's soothing is much better than trying to break the pattern of sleep by getting up and doing something else. Does, does depression work the other way, like you can't sleep? Absolutely. Again, that's, a, that's an important symptom of depression. Uh, um, sleeping problems can be signs of other kinds of illness or disorders, but certainly it's very closely linked to depression. Hmm. So I think that's very important for people to just, if they're starting to uh, get kind of entrenched in a, in a sad state of mind, or mm -hmm. they notice um, uh, changes in their appetite, changes in their weight, changes in their overall sense of well-being and functioning, it's a good idea to look at sleep as one of the first things to uh, consider. Hmm. If you're sleep deprived, point. I think most of us don't do very well when we're sleep deprived. There's a little euphoria at first, like yeah. students who pull an all-nighter, yeah. which I've done, of course, many times <laughs> over the years, but try not to do any more. Um, this kind of thing can really throw you off for the next few days and uh, unsettle your, your, own, your body's ability to regulate itself. Now, we hear a lot in the media about alcohol and opiates, mm -hmm. and alcohol is a depressant, correct? It is. It's a barbiturate and uh, does tend to uh, slow us down. Um, at, there is a, a kind of a, a soothing aspect. Uh, there's a temporary sense of, of euphoria or feeling better, uh, but uh, and a sense of, I think the, the main thing is a lot of people lose their inhibition or whatever seems to be holding them back when they're drinking. Uh, so it can be very freeing, very liberating, but it is a temporary thing. And actually what's happening on a physical level is that we're being kind of uh, shut down or um, um, suppressed. And so uh, that is definitely having an effect on, on mood. And in the cases of depression I've seen where alcohol or other substances are involved, it complicates it immeasurably. Because it's, it's like two layers of depression. Two layers of depression. You're depressed, and then you have alcohol on top of it, so now right. you're even more depressed. Yes, exactly. Right? I'd like to just start, though, I mean, I'd kind of like to go back and, and mention something that precedes that, and that is that depression can actually be a sign of physical illness, some, mm -hmm. uh, some physical illness. And uh, there are many different kinds of... Um, problems and diseases for which depression could be a symptom. So it's very hard to say which one unless you go consult a doctor. But if you're experiencing depression for any period of time, 
uh, I think it's really important first uh, to go maybe to your, to your uh, primary care physician and just get checked out. A lot of people don't like to do that. They say, oh, later, later, later. But the sooner you take care of it, the much better chances you ha are of having to um, manage uh, depression or, or any other symptoms uh, much more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so after the physical layer, then uh, I would be definitely wanting to ask somebody about their uh, habits with any type of um, uh, alcohol, drugs, cigarettes, um, any kind of substance that's affecting our chemical system. Okay. Um, I know you work with uh, children. Mm -hmm. To some extent. And I families. tend to work mostly with older children, but yes. And older children, mm -hmm. okay. Are there differences in depression um, symptomatically with, with yeah. kids versus mm -hmm. adults? Across the lifespan, uh, depression sometimes appears a bit differently. With children, uh, you might find them to be just a little extra clingy, a little extra needy, uh, irritable, um, easily upset, and you just can't attribute it to anything in particular, or it just seems to be uh, a bit out of sync with their normal behavior. Hmm. Um, with teenagers, uh, again, irritability might come up more, or be more noticeable than, say, sadness or, or being withdrawn but they may also be withdrawn. I've noticed with uh, teenage uh, people that um, t often there's uh, self-esteem issues going on that mm -hmm. are very closely related to depression. Mm. Um, negative messages that they're either being given by the outside world or that they perceive uh, or that they just are telling themselves. Mm. So that's one of the best things that we can try to do. Again, you asked earlier about what people can do to help themselves. Um, and I think a lot of people want to help themselves or they want to help their friends before going to a therapist. Um, this can be a great thing, of course. I think in uh, our, our history, uh, we didn't have therapists and we relied very much on, on our um, places of worship, our religion, uh, religious faith, our um, families and, and friends to kind of help us through hard times. But um, these are, there is a point when someone external and objective could be a great ally and support, and there is this reluctance. But if you want to try to manage it yourself, some psychologists uh, believe strongly that we can try to confront our depression, and one of the ways to do that is to, to take note, maybe even write down on a piece of paper, what you're telling yourself about yourself. Hmm. Um, that uh, belongs to what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's a great first step to just take note of whether you're doing it by yourself or with a therapist. What am I telling myself? Like, and, I can't do it, um, I'm frustrated, right. there's no way I can catch up, mm -hmm. things like that. All those kind of, uh, they tend to be negative messages, and they quickly trigger our feelings, and our feelings tend to dictate often how we're going to react. It can work the other way, I've found in, in my work, that uh, sometimes people notice the feeling more, and then we have to sort of suss out, well, what does that make you think and do? Mm -hmm. Or we see people with... Um, irritable, uh, impulsive behaviors. And we have to sort of suss out, well, what feelings belong to that and what are the thoughts that somebody are telling themselves? But mm -hmm. this sort of triangle between what one's thinking, how that makes us feel, and how we behave is this dynamic that we want to try to become, to make more conscious. Because once we know what we're dealing with, we can then usually uh, realize the limitations of the messages that we're telling ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you find a difference um, with, uh, you treat elderly too? The elderly yeah, this population? is so important. You know, um, a lot of elderly people, whether li they're living independently or they're living with family members or they're living in uh, assisted living or a nursing home, wherever they are, um, it's very common to uh, slip into a depressive state of mind. Maybe partly uh, I've noticed one factor is uh, the, the dependence that older people sometimes, may, maybe they're having more physical problems, uh, maybe they're more dependent on others and they've been used to being independent. So 
there's some type of a discrepancy. But a lot of people tend to not notice it in older people as though that's somehow normal or to be expected mm. or we just have to live with it. Mm. And that's not the case. Depression mm. can be treated in elderly people, absolutely. Maybe, in all ages. Maybe for some of the elderly, could it be that they, they can't get out as much as they want to? Sure, absolutely, that could be a reason. I think in general, there tends to be some discrepancy. The, the uh, depression is alerting us to some discrepancy in ourselves between some instinctual need that's not being met mm. and something larger that we might think we're supposed to do or behave a certain way or we have to, we have to accept certain kinds of things. And often we do, but again, with the help of a therapist, we can sometimes untangle this web of what our real personal individual needs are and where we're feeling the pressure to conform or acquiesce or uh, make do. And uh, that can be very important because there may be lots of solutions that just haven't been put on the table yet. You know, I think it's a really good point in talking about the elderly that people tend not to recognize it. Yeah, and I mean the elderly themselves and their yeah. family members. Yeah. There's something in our culture perhaps that just, um, you know, here we are in, in New England and Massachusetts and there's definitely an old kind of Yankee uh, toughness and stubbornness, uh, independence, uh, leave me alone, I'll figure it out for myself sort of attitude. Mm. and. Uh, as a New Englander, I'm proud of that, but I'm also trying to be more and more cognizant of its limits. And uh, we have to remember uh, to be ready to ask for help when we need it. And just the fact of talking about an issue mm -hmm. can, can provide some relief to a person. Absolutely. Because it discharges the emotion. That's exactly right. Do I have right. that right? That's right. Our, our, our bodies are taking in stimuli from the world and from our inner from our bodies themselves. So it's kind of coming from two ways. And our emotions are helping to process this for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they get um, kind of stuck in a pattern that we can't seem to lift out of, then mm -hmm. we're talking about a depressive state mm -hmm. uh, with feelings that we can't regulate anymore so easily. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd like to mention that's uh, sort of adjacent to what we're saying that I've noticed, uh, we, you asked about working with young people. I've noticed a lot of young people are, you know, they're so great about wanting to step in and assist their friends mm -hmm. or family members and kind of be a buffer uh, between themselves, that, that, that person in distress and the adults in their lives or uh, professionals, uh, maybe people at school who could help them. But there's, uh, you know, they're trying to protect their privacy or they're afraid that their friend won't want them to reveal this. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed a lot of young people tend to take on a great deal on themselves mm -hmm. to be this caretaker for their friends. Mm -hmm. And while this is um, a very loving act, it can have other aspects. Uh, it can fill us a little bit with our own sense of self-importance and we might misgauge where the other, where some other kind of help really is necessary. Mm -hmm. God forbid we would never want to have on our conscience that we were so caught up in trying to not get somebody help mm -hmm. that um, uh, if they injured themselves in some way, you know, it would be very hard to accept that we hadn't sought help. So for a lot of young people, it's how do I go get help? Mm -hmm. uh, who can I trust? Um, can I uh, talk to somebody in confidence? And I would urge young people never to hesitate to get help by a trusted teacher or counselor at school, mm -hmm. family member or outside therapist. And sometimes you can begin the conversation by saying, may I speak to you confidentially? Or can we make this off the record? Now, it doesn't always mean that that person can't take some action on behalf of the truly needy person, mm -hmm. but they can uh, often protect your own uh, identity in that process. Or you could write a note. It, it could be anonymous. It's better, I think, if you come forward in person. But mm -hmm. to take some action as opposed to just thinking you can handle it yourself mm -hmm. or it'll go away or my friend will be fine or... Um, you know, this is, these are just, I would definitely urge people to try to get that help in, in whatever stepping stones they need. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, you know, in our schools, we have 
um, help readily available. We have school psychologists in every building and at yeah. our middle and high school. We have an adjustment counselor. That's fantastic. We have That's um, wonderful. social workers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I feel like we have a really good it's connection. Great. I used to teach for many years and I've worked in systems where uh, the school didn't take that as seriously as you do in your system and it's really, really great that you have that support for people. I can't stress that enough, that's wonderful. Um, in terms of staying with the theme of children, it's, it would seem to me it's kind of hard to treat kids without treating the family. Yeah, that's very important. Or bringing important. the parents into. Yes, it is. Very often there's, a, there's some kind of a connection and sometimes adults, as I said, are more reluctant to think of themselves as needing help. But why shouldn't they get support for dealing with a very difficult family problem? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's tough when you're doing it within a system to sort everything out yourselves. Every person in the system of a family has their own needs. And if you could get a little bit of outside neutral support that's trying to work toward the success and cohesion of the whole family and taking your own needs within that very seriously, why would you turn that down? But unfortunately, many people do. Maybe they're afraid of revealing too much about themselves or their own history, but... Um, or you know, stigma. The, the stigma. Right? I know this is what, you know, I, I think your program is really meant to try to reduce, and I'm, I'm so respectful of your efforts in that area. Well, there is one other thing about children we haven't talked about, uh, that, or not just children, but especially with children. Um, you know, ADHD is very common, and a lot of people have a hard time uh, differentiating uh, the behaviors that might go with attention deficit and uh, depression. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the kind of scattered um, attention issues of someone struggling with ADHD at any age, um, that sort of masks a depression. Hmm. So uh, that's another reason for checking it with a therapist. A therapist can be kind of keeping an eye on differentiating those and, and trying to find the right solutions whether it might be an adjustment in medication or giving a chance to air uh, some concern uh, that has been bothering somebody or both of those things. You know, it's nice to be able to give somebody a chance to unpack the various things that are occurring and not just assume their behavior is all about ADHD. Life is complicated, <laughs> isn't it? It, it is, and we've, it's, we've made it more and more complicated, I think, even as a when culture. We, right, even when we talk about a diagnosis, mm -hmm. ADHD, mm -hmm. it's sometimes, it's, as you say, it's not just the ADHD, it's yes. not just the hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. There could be a layer of depression with that, right. there could be a layer of anxiety with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. A lot of, we're gonna have, I think you have another program where one of my colleagues will be talking on that topic. Another one is, I I think you have somebody coming in perhaps to talk about bereavement. That's also important to just mention with respect to depression. Um, as I said, you know, our, we're always trying to regulate our environment and our emotions are trying to help us uh, self-regulate. And when we experience a loss, whether it's the death of a loved one or, um, or any kind of a loss, mm -hmm. um, that is a major, major shock to the, the, the body and the emotional system, of course. And with that, um, we sometimes don't think of, we don't know whether to call that depression. Um, clinically, we don't call it depression within a certain period of time because it's the body's bereavement and grief is a normal way to, to, um, to cope. But prolonged grief or bereavement um, might, where it's really impacting somebody's functioning, might then uh, give us cause to think in terms of depression and stepping in and treating depression. But bereavement itself initially is not depression. Right, right. right. It, it's a normal reaction. Exactly. So f sorting these is sometimes tricky terrain. So if someone needed help, needed to make a call, um, I guess what I would say, because sometimes I get calls at my office, mm -hmm. um, is to check who their insurance provider is. Yes, right. And then go down the list. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you have Blue Cross, yes. for example, they'll give you a list of therapists. Yes. And then you can see if they're in the Lower Cape area mm -hmm. or in Hyannis. Mm -hmm. 
and see if they take the the um, if there's someone well if they're on the list they take the they take that insurance yes and then um, make a phone call or they could try um, child and family services I, w I certainly hope they would there there are people in private practice as well mm -hmm. all over Cape Cod absolutely um, yeah, this is getting help is is so important. I think if someone's well enough, it really is not feeling too is feeling you know some agency, then it is a great thing to check with your insurance first because it can be frustrating to go get help only to find that your particular insurance uh, can get you this kind of help but not this kind. So if you can get to the right kind of help that your insurance automatically provides, that's obviously a great start. But I don't think that should prevent somebody who's in deep distress from taking the first step and getting help anywhere and then letting them help you get your insurance situation sorted out. And certainly, um, you know, in the case of people who are feeling suicidal, yeah. uh, we have a tendency in this culture to... Um, you know, want to turn a blind eye, and it's of course terrifying if we have a family member or a friend who is struggling with suicidal thoughts, or ourselves thinking with suicidal thoughts. Um, it's very uh, distressing to know what we should do. But um, if you're concerned about somebody feeling suicidal, it's almost always better to ask. Really, just put it right out there. Are you are you thinking of of injuring yourself, or hurting yourself, or killing yourself? Um, this can be very important and give this person this necessary purge that you said so they've been carrying this terrible feeling and weight around and they have a chance to express um, can sometimes be a first step toward getting help. Um, and then to actually get help, you know, if you're in a dire situation, you can call 911, you can call the hospital or get in the car and go there if you can get somebody to, to get to the hospital. I have a number here for the suicide hotline that I wrote down for you, if I can find it. Um, um, yes, uh, it's kind of, they've tried to make it easy for people. It's 1-800-273-TALK. In other words, T-A-L-K on your phone would be 1-800-273-8255. Um, if you're a military veteran, and we thank our veterans most especially on Veterans Day today, uh, you would uh, press number one, and that will take you straight to a specific crisis line just for oh, veterans. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, um, last thoughts. Um, or can you share with us an experience that you've had with some clients or okay. a client? Okay, maybe we have time for one uh, quickly. Yeah, I can think of uh, a really, uh, first of all, you know, there's a whole spectrum of uh, depression that, that's more manageable and depression that's sometimes manageable and depression that seems never manageable. Depression can be a matter of duration, how long it lasts or when it occurs, and it can be one of intensity. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different ways it can, it can show up in our lives. Uh, but... Um, in a case I can think of, of extreme depression, uh, where in this particular case, it was a young man uh, where this probably started, there was a little bit of symptomology in, um, in uh, middle school, but nothing that anybody really associated with depression, and they didn't get help until later. Uh, and then uh, one of the features that exacerbated this particular case was uh, excessive time on the computer, and it mm. became apparent that this this student, uh, this person, student, was using all their non-school time to kind of withdraw from the world and just be constantly on the computer, mm. usually playing very violent games or taking in a lot of negative. Um, kind of uh, imagery. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, this kind of uh, negative mood and, and mentality and negative self-talk messages mm -hmm. uh, became entrenched and mm -hmm. the depression became very, very deep and even suicidal, mm -hmm. compounded by drug use, uh, compounded by alcohol. And uh, w I'm very happy to tell you that in this case it took quite a long time but by gradually uh, helping that uh, that person get ample opportunity to 
be treated as a as a as an individual among many mm. to really hear what their story is and what their needs are and what their uh, what they're telling themselves is, is a very important part of it but then also gradually to reduce the number of medications or whether they were prescribed or self found uh, reducing uh, these step by step cautiously um, and uh, w was a tremendous uh, change of personality wow. could occur. And the more genuine personality became more tolerable to that, to the person, uh, with the support from an outside therapist. Right. As the um, drugs were, and alcohol were used less and less and less to buffer that pain. Right. It was very understandable that they turned to that, but how great for them that they were able to gradually release their dependence on that and depend more on uh, a therapist in particular and other people and lifestyle changes uh, to be able to start to give new messages to themselves mm -hmm. and shift those feelings and gradually create new patterns. And that, uh, that story touched my heart in particular because it did seem very, very hopeless, and it constellated in uh, people a sense of hopelessness. But it was one of the most extreme cases I've seen, and it was um, has turned around tremendously through this layered approach and taking all the time necessary. Wow, that was, that was life-saving. It was life-saving. It really was. Mm -hmm. You know, I also wanted to mention, we talked about kids who have attention deficit disorder yeah. and other, other types of disorders, but we, we need to be cognizant and not to forget the kids who have straight A's mm -hmm. and how much pressure yes. the kids can be under yes. without yes. us knowing. Mm -hmm. You know, you think, oh, well, my daughter's doing well, my son's doing well, they're doing really, really well, but, right. you know, just to be aware. Well, I think one thing that can possibly uh, be important is for um, the parents who are saying that to just take a moment and think, just really ask a hard question to oneself. I'm a parent and I have to do this. Um, you know, in what ways is it important to me for this, for everything to be going well for this person? Mm -hmm. um, we, we want to reassure ourselves a lot that mm -hmm. things are going well for somebody, but sometimes it's our own need. And if we can back off and just put that in the right place, that can <laughs> work wonders. Um, by itself, because mm -hmm. sometimes that pressure is being felt unconsciously by the, the young person. But there is a tremendous amount of, uh, of pressure already in the school system. A lot of our culture seems to think everybody needs to go to college uh, and to go to an excellent college, and there's a tremendous amount of self-proving having to go on all the time mm -hmm. at the expense of the individual and their unique gifts uh, the beauty of their own soul, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, their own preferred ways of expression. So I think it's a question of balancing that all that time that goes into prepara preparing homework and assignments and so forth, that there's also ample time for uh, things that person genuinely loves to do. Mm -hmm. And not for the parents not to mistake that they think that child loves that sport or loves that activity, but to really... Remember what the child loved as a child, and are these new interests in any way? Not that we can't develop new interests, mm -hmm. but you know, try to um, really think what is in the true nature of that child, and what is the difference between what that child needs and what I, as a parent, need. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the most unhappy children that I've met in the course of my life and work have been children who are suffering. Uh, the um, split between their own needs and what their parent needed them to be. Mm -hmm. So while we're lucky that uh, many, uh, you know, there are a lot of people, everybody's trying to do their best as a parent. It's got, got to be the hardest job alive, <laughs> hardest job there is. Sure. Uh, but to just to keep in mind uh, working on one's own needs uh, separately from those of the child and, and getting support for that. That's a good point. And I think one of our takeaways from this mm -hmm. session is session, shall we say, sure. <laughs> or show, is check in with each other. Yes. Whether it's the elderly, whether it's a child, whether it's a family, um, just check in with each other, see if things are going okay, and if they're not, why not? And if they are, that's great. Mm -hmm. 
But I'd like to thank you for coming today, Margot. It's a pleasure. Thank um, you. A privilege. Thank you for having me, and thank you for this great work you do for the community. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>